we get to the exciting part of the meeting where I get to introduce our special guest. And um, tonight's artist was drawn to art at an early age and hoped to, to make art his career. He was originally training as an oil painter in both high school and college until he met Japanese artist Kaji Aso while attending the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Professor Aso taught not only watercolor, but also Sumi painting, calligraphy, and Eastern aesthetics. Gary Tucker discovered then that he could achieve more subtlety and expressiveness in watercolor and immediately felt at home with the media of watercolor. He also loved studying the works of John Singer Sargent and how Sargent's brushwork could describe a subject so effortlessly. Uh, Gary Tucker makes his home in Boston, um, but he does enjoy traveling frequently to the West Coast and um, the Southern part of the United States and also to Europe. He teaches both drawing and painting. And last night, he was kind enough to meet me on Zoom for a camera chat at 10.15 in Boston time after he had finished teaching his drawing class. Uh, keep in mind, he's located in Boston, so that's Eastern time. So it's three hours later there. So it's awfully nice that he was willing to do this demonstration because it seems late night for him. And I appreciate that. I asked Gary for what he thought was an aha moment in his watercolor journey. He pointed out that he had discovered how important painting in plain air has been to his art. He notes that it's a struggle to go outdoors to leave the security of the studio at times and to stand in front of nature to paint. But the rewards far outweigh that effort. He says, I've learned more from working outdoors than just about anything else. On a personal note, Gary let me know that he's been known to do some singing, especially in the car or with a group. I don't know if he sings when he paints, but I guess we'll find out. And he also likes poetry and to pick up an accordion once in a while. So let us give a warm welcome to Gary Tucker. Gary? Thank you, Michelle. Can you hear me okay? Yes, that's great. Okay. Well, thank you for having me tonight. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share what I know about this media that we all love uh, with you tonight. I'm going to um, be giving a presentation with a thought that you might be painting along. Um, and I say that because the way that I usually present a class or a demonstration is especially uh, on the Zoom format, is to um, begin by, <clears throat> um, well, giving you a little description about what I want to do. And then I break the demonstration into a couple parts. And I give you a little prelude before each part. And, and the reason that's important is um, it's very brief. And if you try to paint along with that, you're going to get into trouble. So I cue you. Uh, as to when there's uh, some highlights, let's call them highlights, and then for the paint along. And that's pretty much what I prepared tonight is a presentation of a painting that I did of the Dordogne Valley. I don't know if you've traveled there, but it's a, uh, near Southern France, a beautiful place uh, to go if you're starting to think to travel again. It's not as popular as uh, Provence and and some of the other beautiful areas in, in South France. But it has a lot of rich history and a lot of um, beauty there. And so I took a group over there prior to the pandemic. And uh, there was one place in particular where it was an overlook of the, the river itself. That's what uh, we're going to be painting today. So um, are we shall I go ahead and start? Um, yeah, I, again, as unless anybody has any questions, um, I, I will mention that um, you can always put your questions into the chat. And um, because the um, because we're going to be watching a video of uh, Gary painting, 
he can actually answer those questions in the chat or um, if it needs more attention, he can stop the video and, and answer from here, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. that sounds uh, that sounds perfect. Um, go ahead. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and then we'll get to this. I'm also gonna check the volume before I get started. I believe it's at maximum, but I just wanna make sure. <clears throat> Sharing the screen. And yeah, it's at maximum right now. So, all right. Uh, well, Michelle has sent you this image that we're looking at up in the right hand corner here. I use the image uh, when I'm getting started uh, to start to um, place the shapes, the major shapes and get things um, satisfactory to where I can start to paint. Then I'll um, be showing you more of my palette and the tonal study that I did prior to this. <clears throat> um, my palette is gonna be to the right. And uh, I believe that Michelle also sent you a list of the, the materials list so that you could have those colors that I'm gonna be using and a sort of brush selection of what I'm gonna be using handy. In any case, you'll notice right off that I'm working at a pretty steep uh, pitch. And I do that to enable the color to flow downward. It's a little unusual. And, and uh, another reason I do that is simply for presentation. I find it's a good way to record a video and show it more clearly. So that's what you're seeing now is you're seeing the image, my palettes on the right, and uh, my papers here. It's about 12 by 16. It's a uh, Saunders Waterford 140 rough. I like this paper, but I go between the Arches and the Saunders and the Fabriano. So I think, and I've got it mounted to a board with masking tape. And this is typically how I'll work. Um, using a 2B pencil and eraser. So I think that covers the materials. I mean, other than the colors, which were in the list. And I'll go ahead and start and we'll get started drawing this. What I look for uh, are some of the singular shapes, the bigger shapes that we find on the valley floor. So the main one is the river, the river that's transversing the scene, exiting the scene about here, winding up and taking us to the back of the painting. So this is just what we want, just what we need to kind of portray the Dordogne River. And this angle also tells us a lot about the perspective. It's rising in the picture plane. That gives us the impression that um, we're looking down on the, our subject. We're looking down from a great height. And the reason this is communicated is because um, we're standing about here. Our eye level is almost uh, on the mountain range back here, pretty much on these mountains. Somewhere back here is our eye level. Everything below our eye level is going to be ascending in the picture plane. So naturally, the river is going to be moving in this direction. and. It's kind of our first observation, our first major observation. When we, when we look at our picture, we see this rising river plain. We see it meandering also towards the back, getting thinner, uh, making some turns, and then disappearing. This is just perfect for what we want to portray. And so we place these lines to establish that shape of the river wandering through the Dordogne Valley. And um, okay, so we've got, we've got that, we've placed that. We have an angled line here, which is basically a road. And we have another one just where the bridge crosses. Also at an angle, slightly rising This is great. I mean, horizontal lines 
uh, would be a little static in this case. So that angled line is to my liking. And I'm building that bridge. This is my focal area in the painting. And I think many of you have heard me talk about this at length. What is the focal area? Why do we think about that? How is it helpful? Why is it important? All, all good questions. And think about it uh, maybe like a, we're familiar with grammar in a language. And grammar has verbs, pronouns, a noun, has a subject. And the subject is sort of at the root of what we're trying to say in, in the language. So this is very much, uh, I think, similar to what a center of interest is, a focal point. Um, we need that to communicate, whether we're communicating visually, whether we're communicating in music, uh, anything, dance, having a sort of a center of interest or a major movement or a refrain or a subject gives us, well, helps us communicate with our audience. And for us as visual artists, it's helpful because it gives us a reference. So the scale is important in this bridge. How big is it? The reflection, we see the reflection below. It gives us a feeling of how big the, the uh, river is. Um, other things do that as well, but the bridge helps us there. It's sort of a man-made structure against all of this nature. It's a bright element against the mid-tones. It helps to orient us. And so we use that to kind of build our composition, to start our structure. And I'm going to be placing some major lines in proximity to the bridge. So for example, those trees, smaller trees near the bridge. The bridge narrows here. I have a big tree coming in front of it. I like that. I'll look for other visual clues. So more trees back here, smaller of course. We start to see farmlands and that's indicated by these rows, rows of crops or roads that are flanked by trees. Are we going to draw all of these? No. Uh, it would be too much. We'd spend all day just making our drawing. But let's do the major ones. And in fact, it, leaving some of this unfinished in the drawing is actually to our benefit. When we're in the field, it's the same idea. We try to see the major lines, the major shapes. And by major, I mean the larger shapes, the shape of this whole pl um, plane or this plane or the plains back here of the, of the sloping mountains. These are shapes, first of all, and seeing them as shapes is instrumental in bringing accuracy to your drawing, bringing accuracy then to your painting. Do we see any structures, any other structures other than bridge? It's really hard to see. We see a small house here and there. I think that could be useful. Let's give it the proper size. It's not going to be anything bigger than that. Kind of flanked for, by some darker trees. That's another indication of scale. And scale for this image in particular is very important because we're looking um, over a vast space, aren't we? We're seeing a vast space 
and we need that to be communicated. We want that scale to be felt. Some more fields. Little, looks like a little orchard down here. So this is the Dordogne Valley, which has been cultivated for centuries. Um, basically, under French rule at one time, under English rule, it's been a, you can find castles from both cultures lining the banks of the Dordogne. So it's a very interesting area. And this place in particular, where we're standing, is a city called Dom. And you reach it by an, a long winding road, narrow road that takes you to the village of Dom. And at the edge of the village, you see this fence that is flanking this beautiful vista. So it's a major stop for anyone who's traveling in the area. I think we've done enough drawing. Um, the major lines are indicated. We've got some divisions suggested. The trees, the bridge, the shape of the river, our up and down view on the horizon. So let's go ahead and set out our palette and start to create this painting. Here you can see uh, the tonal study that I do beforehand. This is a really helpful practice uh, that I can recommend for just about every project. Um, working with a single color, identifying the lights and darks, puts you in a really good um, position to start to judge the color when you move to a fuller palette. So I keep that right where I can see it. And uh, uh, sometimes I refer to that even more than I do the photograph. So this first part is highlights. Uh, I'm just gonna play it through. And then I'm gonna return to this point and we'll paint it in real time. Everyone put down your brushes and give me your attention. I wanna walk you through the first stages of uh, the first stage of the painting. So I'm starting with a wash up above. You notice that I'm placing some water in the sky and <clears throat> then mixing up a pale greenish blue made from cobalt and a little bit of cerulean as well as some of the green, uh, I think I'm using sap green. Yes. And I'm mixing it up on the palette, but look at the consistency. It's very watery because I want to start as pale as possible in the back here so that it just fades to almost nothing. This is going to help me to describe uh, the vast space that we have and how the distance just sort of melts into the horizon. I'm working down the painting from the top and my approach will be to the right side of the river first and I'm starting to build a little more yellow into that green and a little less blue I think you notice the difference I'm working with a large mop brush so that I can keep the wash wet and as I come down I'm leaving little gaps or holidays um, based on some of the lines that I was drawing these these gaps um, I'm perfectly comfortable with them because I'd like them to, in the long run, function as um, a road or a house or some other um, part of the landscape that's going to break up the screen and give, you know, a reference to, um, like I said, roads, uh, fields, or houses, or this sort of thing, and. The angle, I feel, is important to kind of describe the lay of the land. So as I'm, um, well, the drawing helps me here because I figured it out in the drawing 
and basically just avoiding to paint everything and the strokes that I'm using are kind of following the lay of the land so it's very easy to leave a few little bits of lines and spaces and uh, resolve those later. My main concern is to build up the right hand side and get a feeling of depth in the distance. As the pigment dries the yellow is going to come forward a little more and uh, also in my mind are the trees that are going to eventually help me here. So here you can see this uh, green has been placed and there's quite a variety. On first glance you just see green but on second glance you see how the blue is added to the back and more yellow to the front. This gradation, this soft, soft gradation helps a lot to create depth. So what I'm doing now is adding just a few strokes into the wet paint. Just a suggestion of trees, um, some irregular shapes along the side of the river, uh, a few strokes in the foreground here to give a feeling of a field, and the calligraphy really says it all. It helps to describe um, some things that would normally be difficult to describe with a simple line, a simple shape. We can describe uh, trees and fields and all sorts of stuff. And I'll do that towards the back as well. The green is uh, thicker, darker at this stage. And I'm just placing some trees along the road or along the river to take advantage of the wet nature of the paper. At the same time, start to build up that uh, reference to trees and fields. You'll notice that the trees uh, tend to get smaller in the distance. Repeated shapes getting smaller in the distance is another way that we communicate this vast space. So I'm taking some time now to build up uh, the reflection of the sky in the river below and the paper is dry. I'm adding a little bit of water and then following it with um, a brush full of cobalt blue. Important here to clean out the brush well before you uh, venture into the water because the green is sort of pervasive so I clean off the brush well I put a little water down in the white shape of the river and then start to add blue color into that. And because we're working fast with the big brush, we're naturally getting a variety of edges, which I really like to see. Some of the edges are soft, some are hard. Um, this is great for um, creating the sort of illusion of, that we're creating of, um, you know, this, the layout of the road and the bridge, trees along the water, fields, a lot of things uh, to paint, but we can do it in an expressive way and keep our eye kind of focused on the part that I'm painting now, the bridge that spans the water. Um, there's going to be some extra detail, some white of the paper, some strong darks in this area. So this is my center of interest and it's uh, um, I kind of balance the rest of the painting off of this visually. One thing that's helpful in describing, describing the surface of the water is to use a lot of wet and wet technique as I'm doing now and to let the reflections come straight down basically whether it's the sky, the bridge, these trees that line the Dordogne, um, reflections tend to come straight down so I'm using the stroke to to do that straight down into the water and just let it spread out because we're working into the wet surface and we want it to feel as though it's got a soft edge and the reflection while it's dark is a soft shape. Looking good, I think we need to pause for a moment and uh, let this dry. 
So now we're going to watch the full-length version of this first stage. I hope you'll pick up your brushes and work along with me. Well, it's pretty clean, ready to go. I'm going to start by mixing up a little of the green that I want to use. This is my cadmium yellow. It's a very strong color. I'm going to add quite a bit of water to it. This is the green, the sap green I was talking about. Sap green has also quite a bit of yellow already added. I see it mostly as a shortcut. And, uh, well, kind of a very smoky, humid feeling today. So I'm going to start with water back here. that out of my brush. Just start with water. And we're going right over the mountains and we start to hit the valley floor, the, a plane change right about here. So I'm going to start to introduce the green. And I'm going to be adding some of my cobalt blue to this green. I'll be starting with a little bluer green and working it towards a yellowish green. Trying to create some of that feeling of distance. Okay. And as I go, I am going to be keeping some little breaks, little skips, little pieces of white. I think we can put a bit more yellow with that. The yellow will definitely start to increase as we move lower into the painting. Where am I leaving these whites? I'm leaving them uh, for roads, or in the case of this house. Start to make it a little thicker. Means with a little more yellow. want to avoid the river as well. She meanders towards the back here. Now I'm just going to stay on this side for the moment since the river's now kind of dividing the painting. Adding a bit more sap green and yellow to the mix. Right over everything. Let's add a little more of that green to the mixture, a little more yellow. deeper green through here. I'm going to start to add a little bit of hmm, bird sienna.
this. Like that. I think I can add just a touch more yellow. A little more burnt sienna. Touch more green. Come through here. Well, we can see that graded wash, can't we? How that's creating a feeling of depth. Okay, let's come down now to the left side. I'm gonna add some water and a little bit of blue to this green. Thank goodness the water runs downhill just started anyway. Back here. There we go. And we'll start to build in the shape of the river. In the tonal study I created the shape of the water first of the river if you remember. And it can go either way truly. Usually the it makes sense to paint that light value first. Oops that was a lot of yellow. got a lot of water on the paper so no problem I'm gonna bring in fact a lot of yellow to this side here a little bit of that up before I had the chance to dry just sun dry brush like more of a melting effect up on the top there. Okay, and more yellow, a little more green, a little brown, loosely mixed, let's do that. So you see already we're getting some variations in the green, blue, to yellow, to red, all in the green. Tonally, they're very similar. The light and dark quality is very similar, but uh, the, the color is changing subtly. A little more yellow through here. And we'll leave some whites too. Put a little more, <coughs> excuse me, I think this is okay. This is our foundation. We're going to certainly add to this. But the shape of the river is captured. We've left some bits of white here and there. While it's a little wet, yes, we can do a couple things. You know, say we want to create a little darker tree, and I'm going to do some of that around the bridge, I think. So I'm switching to a smaller brush, smaller sable brush, and I'll take out a lot of the paint before I, there we go, something like this. Mix it into this wet area. Get a little darker tree to, to start with. Maybe some of that into here as well. And I'm not painting these 
trees necessarily in shade, just giving a little darker green along the <clears throat> water's edge, specifically near the bridge, my focal point. I am keen on capturing that focal point, as you are no doubt learning. Couple smaller trees. Just some, a few stronger darks while the paint is wet so that we get some bleeding. Kind of controlled bleeding. These marks are sort of just indicating the, the tops of the trees or a little bit of shadow in the trees. And the angle is meant to kind of create this slope, a slope down to the river. Already it's quite pleasing because of this soft transition. We feel the white of the paper actually has some atmosphere. We're going to paint some blue there in the second stage. But for now, I'm just putting some little darker greens along this white road to signify distant trees, faint trees. kind of waiting for the paint to dry a little bit. There, so now we get a little clearer sensation of how the river turns back there. I like that very much in this painting. I have a large area of white here. I'm going to refine that just a little, make it just a small square that will turn into a, a house at some point. Yeah, that's about how big it is, isn't it? All right, let's paint. Let's let this section dry. Let's paint the water. Water is going to be primarily blue, reflecting the sky and the clouds overhead. We can drop in some reflections while it's wet. We can do it now. We can also wait to do that until we have stronger sense of the trees along the side. I think I'm going to try and do some of that now. I've got cobalt here, which I'm going to use. In, I used in the background a little bit. I'm going to use that more in the next stage. Cobalt and little bit of burnt sienna to gray, that cobalt. These two colors work well together. However, the sienna is quite, can really overtake the cobalt, so you have to be careful. Don't worry about getting the exact same color that I am. It's not try for the exact same value, light and dark. So I'm going to use the white back here. I'm going to simply start with water and come along this edge. And I'm going to leave some whites. Won't bring it right to the edge, but pretty close. Let's stop at the bridge for our first pause. And into that, yes, let's add a little bit of this blue while it's wet. Maybe through here. It's 
So this is a good example of compartmentalization. A little darker. Meaning that we break our painting progress at certain intervals that are manageable. Like that. And I'm going to experiment by taking some darker color, a little smaller brush and some darker color, a darker green, I think, using some of this green and blue, a little bit of brown. Anyway, you know, we have some trees that kind of line the side here. And I want to create some reflections while I can. You notice how the reflection color just dissolves when I put it into the water's edge. A little more. And this is to sort of get a feel for what I can expect in other stages. Okay. Good, let's do this lower part of the water. Starting with just clean water and big brush. Right under the bridge. And I'm gonna try to avoid the bridge itself. In other words, the bridge is gonna remain white. water. To kind of wet this area. Then we switch to a smaller brush and a little bit of that cobalt blue. A little stronger now. This is where we're kind of creating our gradient. Here I'm following the drawing pretty much. Probably could be better, but it's okay for now. And we capture the bridge. And it's still very wet, so this is good. Let's carry some of that over here. Bring in a little, oops, not the green, but more of a kind of grayed blue. Just a little bit of a cloud feeling, underside of a cloud. Like that. So we have a nice, simple, shape of white, the white bridge. We're certainly going to add to that in the future, but let's continue our work down. Some more blue sky through here. Maybe a passing cloud. We'll leave that kind of white. This we should bring, since this edge is now dry, I feel comfortable 
comfortable to bring the water's edge right up to the edge of the green that we painted earlier. Okay. And I'm going to introduce just one little extra blue here. I see it in the image and I like it. And let that dissolve. Nice little shock of color. We can echo that to other places. I'm doing it down below. Anyway, all soft edges for the most part, right? That's what we want. And let's add some, you know, some of those shadows, reflections. You notice that the green on the right bank is very bright, the, the foliage and the fields, but that the shadow color is quite dark. I'm going to use a lot of blue, a little bit of brown. More, more. Color's pretty thick here, isn't it? And we'll start here where we have the larger shadows, just along the edge. These trees are tall, so they're going to be casting longer shadows. Where else can we do that? We have a vertical tree, maybe right here. Some more shadows from trees and a large mass of trees here. Creating a, a nice definition, a very natural definition for the edge of the water. One more blue. Burnt sienna. You can put some green in there too if you like. So taper that edge. Some places let, I mean the shadow let it you know, flow down. Some places very skinny. Usually it's descriptive of the trees that line the edge. On this side, we don't have so much, do we? But we need something. Let's put some, just some touches to remind us that we need something. Most of the reflections that we see are on the right side, which makes sense because the reflections always come toward us. So we're not gonna see many reflections on this side, more the edges of trees, which we come to next. Okay, so the valley floor is starting to come alive based on shapes, based on some of the lines that traverse. Um, we're creating depth through this soft edge, and we've set up that bright green, uh, now ready to add some darker greens to it, the mountains in the distance, Let's pause here. Let's look at section two. Our paper is dried. Let's put down the brushes and I'm just going to walk you through some of the important steps in this second uh, go into the painting. Starting off with just plain water up at the top of the page, just like we did before. Only now I'm mixing up a stronger uh, blue to paint the mountains. And I'm going to use a stroke similar to what we practiced in our drill using a, a the sabolette and creating the mountain range with, you know, one stroke that comes across the right side, one that comes across the left, and basically gives us this impression of the mountain range. Doesn't have to be perfect. I like the way it's a little darker the left than it is the right. And look at how the pigment just kind of settles down and, and falls into that um, the bead that we created when we 
uh, wet this back sky part of our painting. You can see the effectiveness of this big sablette brush. Uh, we can really go forever because once it picks up a certain amount of liquid, just keeps going and going and going. And we're starting to get the background to a finished state. So now I'm doing smaller pattern strokes using the tip of the brush to create the foliage, the trees that line the distant road or distant river. And I'm going to start to bring those forward and getting a little larger, a little darker. What that means is adding a little more uh, green to my mixture so that the paint is a little thicker and also to uh, make the mark just a little bit larger as we come, especially as we get to the lower uh, third of the painting, our trees will be noticeably larger. At this point we can start to uh, create the fields, the patterns of fields, uh, the trees that grow up around the houses, um, the bramble, all sorts of things uh, we can do at this stage. We're working on dry paper so we can move at an even pace. We don't have to rush and we create this patchwork of fields and trees. And it settles nicely onto the green that we have underneath. So they're working together very well. Now I want to take a little time to add some detail. So you see me holding the brush down near the tip. I'm resting my hand on the paper. I need some stability. I'm adding a, a dark warm color under the bridge to give it a little bit of a form to make it feel like it's rising off the water, that it's sunlit, and uh, we also take time to define the water surface. So this small area has a lot of information uh, as it should be. I want it to kind of hold our attention and give us an idea of the scale of the place. This little bridge does a lot to give us scale. Um, and uh, I'll spend as much time as I need in this section to get it sort of right. I'll even paint a little bit of the reflection. Certainly the trees that are in front and behind play a role because they're um, making that light shape of the bridge come out even more. Once I'm relatively satisfied with the way the bridge moves across the water, I'm going to start to uh, place uh, trees and fields on the left-hand side. And look at the stroke I'm using here to create the field. It's basically a line similar to what we practiced before. It's a little bit irregular. It's not perfectly straight. It's not perfectly uh, perfect width, but it gives us that nice quality of the brush. Same time it's describing the perspective that we notice from our where we're standing in relation to the fields and the water. So they're doing a lot even though they're simple strokes they accomplish a lot uh, when combined with the, the rest of the strokes that we're using. starting to have that quality of um, a finish. So th from this stage, I'm not really thinking to do a lot more, certainly nothing dramatic. Uh, we'll paint a few more uh, trees to the back. We'll touch up some of the shadows in the foreground and maybe add a few darker greens if this dries um, paler than we think it should. But haven't done anything on this so the lower right hand corner because I want to keep it sort of nondescript so that our eye basically kind of just slides down the hill and rests on the bridge. I'm trying to accomplish something similar in the right hand corner which is to uh, have a statement of these darker larger trees and longer reflections. At the same time visually I want to kind of close up this corner and keep the eye from <laughs> from following the flow of the water right out of the painting. So it's got two purposes. All right, well, let's pick up our brushes 
and return to our now dry painting starting in the back and we'll work uh, just like I detailed in this little section. Back and dry for the most part. Let's start again. We're going to start in the back, start to create that uh, blue haze with some mountains riding out of the haze, rising out of the haze. Let's start again with just um, the palest of blues. It means a little bit of cobalt, a lot of water back here. Very, very pale. And we'll bring it right down to that first plane. Right through here. Okay, and let's create the mountains now using a little bit of green, but mostly well, a bluish green. A little bit of green mixed with more cobalt. That's going to give us the sort of haze. We want to get some soft edges back here. Soft edges towards that distant slope. So I'm painting into the wet area, creating a mountain, just letting the color drift down. And I'll do the same on the left side. A little more green, perhaps. Create a slope coming in from the left side. Like this. And this is where basically I'm saying the mountains kind of reach the, the valley, those distant mountains. And along this ridge, I'm going to put some darker trees. So back to that green but more blue small brush now and a little thicker color so for example some i need an even smaller brush i think there we go let's head some green and we'll just kind of loosely paint some trees back here and we'll start to bring these trees out onto the plane like this See how we create interlocking edges with our shapes. And then we're going to just continue to carry this down in the form of some trees. I'll show you what I mean. Cobalt blue, that same sap green, perhaps a bit more of the yellow. And so along the river's edge here, we're going to place some, no, a little more blue. That's a little too green, a little too dark. So we're in the distance, even though we're painting, you know, some darker trees, small, dark trees. I don't want to get too green, too bright yet. So I'm adding a lot of blue. More. And this way we sort of get a feeling that the river is continuing back there. We're lining the river with trees. Just leaving the river itself white. road's edge too.
narrow little marks. That's all I'm doing. Like this. And as they come closer, closer to us, we're going to start to add little darker passages. Start to divide these fields. I'm going to work on the right side for the moment. Keep changing the composition of the green a little bit. Here I'm adding a little more brown, for example. and build in some fields. Some crops, just by indicating those sorts of marks. More trees. We know, because most of us have been to cities that have rivers is that um, trees like to form along the river's edge so that we use them to indicate that in the painting just painting some orchard back here right trees rows of trees along the back And I'm trying to be calligraphic. You know, that's something that I like in my work. So whether we're painting city scenes or countryside, brushwork is always important for me. And I prefer to see brush work, even if it's a little inaccurate. So we're just adding some nuance at this point. We can get a little darker. As they come forward, the trees get somewhat darker. to show that sometimes it's along the shadowed side of the tree or the underside of the tree. Oh, this is so relaxing. I hear the sirens, but they really don't alarm me anymore. I've gotten so used to them. Right outside my studio. Here's that little house that we created, it's so tiny, hardly visible, but let's stay with it. Let's put a few dark, almost like cypress trees around the property, we'll accent it that way. These little lines that I'm making are basically shadow, shadow shapes. Making the sunlight feel a little stronger as, it, as we get closer.
and it creates depth. It helps to create that depth that we want. So I add this darker color while the uh, paint is still wet. Set some shadows, take a stronger dark, just using the tip of the brush. See how we trace it along the bottom of the mark we just made. And naturally the wet area pulls it up, softens it, and gives us a very natural feeling shadow, cast shadow. See how that progression of darker greens and bigger shapes contributes to make the feeling of depth more really fading to almost nothing back here whereas through here we have bigger shapes so a few stronger darks Let's use this dark also, since we're in a sort of darker color, to go under the bridge. You notice there's a shadow. I believe it's a shadow, or perhaps it's, yeah, it's a shadow. Or some edging. Some detail work. makes our bridge stand out a little bit. And these rounded lines are where the bridge meets the water. If it's too dark, we can always adjust it. Right now it feels perhaps a little dark. Let's see how it dries. And let's paint the reflection, which is dark and warm. 
Just paint the reverse of this. keep some white here because it really makes it stand out nicely. Well, let's move to the left side. We're crossing the bridge, so to speak. Moving over to the left side, the left bank. We start by Mixing up more of that green. I'm going to add just a little stronger touch. base of this tree, create a little bit of shadow while the color is wet, same as we did on this side. Largely the light is overhead. Like that. of this dry brush here and there. Not a lot. Let's continue. going to do much through here. I'm going to leave that sort of to the imagination. Have some nice fields over here. Orchard.
So I'm really letting my painting tell me where to make these marks. I'm not following too much what's in the photo. When I need some clarity, I look up at the photo and say, yes, that helps. Otherwise, I try to rely on what's already working in the painting. For me, this is a more natural strategy and easier to work with. And we add that same shadow color just at the bottom of our shapes. Give that feeling of overhead light. And then we just taper that off as we move back, adding more water, a little more blue, making our marks a little skinnier. Starting to have a finished quality to it. I'm going to add a few more brownish greens, mostly as, as shadows, especially down here. Returning to the center of interest to get a little more definition, a little more strength. Sometimes I want to lighten an area, so I'll just take a little water, for example, come to the top of this tree, lift out a little bit, and then once it dries, I'll shape it again. I'm going to make it this just a little, a little smoother transition down here, so I'm just adding water and kind of smoothing this out. I don't want it to be too active through here. Just subtle transitions because this is a, a corner of the painting 
and I don't want to bring too much attention to the corner. I want to push the eye up towards the center of interest, which is right through here, and feel that we kind of understand what's going on here, and then the eye kind of, the eye should move around a little bit after that. I'm making this just a little clearer. that point where the shadows come behind the bridge and define the bridge as well. Like that. And even a little bit on this side. No, doesn't need it. Uh, okay, I'm at the mumble stage, so this is where I start to consider tying up the painting. I'm going to try to sort of uh, blur this area with a little bit of blue. Big brush. Blur that corner just a little bit. I don't want it to be too outspoken. But I wanted to push forward a little bit on this green foliage. Just a little bit. Soft in the back, relatively soft in the front. Some sharpness, some real definition through that mid area. Everything from this point will be details. I'm going to add a few of those little stronger darks. Cobalt, burnt sienna. just through my focal area and I'm going to let that dry and see what it looks like before I add them elsewhere. Like a dream, isn't it? Beautiful. That's the finish. And um, um, yeah, I don't know if I have much more to add. I think I, I talked about most of the, the reasons behind uh, the technique, which I always consider before I start how I want to build the painting. And it, it made sense to go from top to bottom and isolate some of the whites in the beginning. You see the role that they play now is to kind of, again, to find the land and create a little, um, just a little disturbance to all of the, the that flowing green. If we have little breaks in that, it actually creates interest. So, any happy to hang around and answer any questions, um, or discuss the painting, or whatever. 
I'm just curious um, how you conduct your workshops. This was this a painting that um, the people at one of your workshops in France did with you or not? Yeah, um, we this one was done in my studio, right? But yeah. I did I did a demo of this same view uh, when we were in Dordogne and and um, we had maybe <laughs> 16 people lined up on the wall that overlooks this valley. And it was such a great scene to see everybody at their easel painting this view. Mm. And, and then we had ice cream after that and talked about the painting. It was just like a perfect day. Oh, I bet. So for your workshops, do you, um, do you do a different painting each day? How does that work? You go on, on, oh. out on location each day to a different location when you're over in Europe? Yes. Um, this one, we were staying at a chateau and we the you can literally drive two minutes and you're going to find something new in this area. There's just that much subject matter. And it's, uh, you know, for the most part, it's pretty rural. So you can stand in the village and paint. You can stand in uh, the marketplace and paint and that's what we did. We went went out every day, and I would do a demonstration in the morning, and then they would paint until noon, or to one, and we'd take a break for lunch, and do basically the same thing in the afternoon, and then we usually gather, you know, over a glass of wine and and hold up our work and talk about it uh, at the end of the day. So it was a pretty full day, but a very rich day two of these you know i think the this workshop was um five days and uh, i think everybody had a pretty good time do you speak french <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> i apologize for that i wish i did it would have made my trip richer but no i have not learned the language <laughs> How do people, how do passerbys respond to seeing your your uh, workshop participants painting? Um, you know, the, the ones that uh, really show interest are the children when we're out in the field. Uh, very often, you know, their parents want to go to, you know, a restaurant or go to the shop and the kids grab their hands and they pull us over and they pull their parents over and they they watch us because this is their this this is their specialty you know painting is something that they do and and enjoy doing so they love to see that happen outdoors in in the open and see people um capturing the nature um and also there's a there's a pretty strong plein air um community in most of southern France, and so it's not uncommon for other painters to come up and and start a conversation. I see. Yeah, so it's a it's a great way to have a, I call it a painting holiday because uh, you're on holiday and you're taking in the history, the food, the uh, everything that goes along with travel, but. When you come back home, you have this, you have, you know, in addition to your photographs, but this is so much, so much more valuable when you are able to sit for an hour or two and do a painting of a cafe or, or of this scene over the Dordogne, you have this, and it means much more to you than any photograph you bring back. It's, it's um, amazing. If you compare them side by side, you've, you just, I guess, because we're, um, so much in the moment and mindful at this point we remember the smells we remember the breeze we remember the temperature we remember if there were sounds all that comes back when you see this painting and uh, that's one of the things that i think um, makes it a worthwhile activity when you travel oh absolutely i feel like painting is something that gets you to focus your attention uh, and be mindful and being able to do that and create something uh, of beauty 
over there and then bring it back home was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. It's a, and a workshop is a good setting because if you're alone and doing this, you do feel very, you know, shy, you feel a little bit intimidated, but if you have 10 other people around you doing the same thing, it's just feels natural and, and you don't feel like everybody's watching you. So <clears throat> it's good to, if you find a workshop or if you have a plein air group, the way you do, um, that gives you more reason to get out and there's less fear involved. Now, um, how did you happen to pick uh, Sweden to go to next year? I was invited by um, a student of mine who she's taken my workshops virtually and she thought it would be a good idea to do something in Sweden. And her job is arranging uh, tours and um, things for musicians. And so she felt she could do that. So I'm letting her put that together. Ah, very nice. Very nice. And Sicily, how did you happen to come uh, decide on that one? Well, you probably, you know, um, Keiko Tanabe is from your neck of the woods. And she recommended me to the owner of a, of a agroturismo situation there in Sicily that entertains uh, yoga workshops and food workshops and all sorts of things like that in their villa. And she's painted there for years and um, introduced me to the management and a very popular place. Yes. I had some uh, friends go there last year um, and seeing their pictures looked, it looked really phenomenal. Like there was a lot to see there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, again, it's a great way to, to travel, I think, to do something a little out of the ordinary, like painting or sketching or, or this sort of thing, um, rather than, as opposed to just uh, following, you know, the, the kind of designated tourist spots and seeing all this stuff. Yes, you see it, but I know for from my experience, when you have a chance to be in one, lo one, one spot for a couple of hours and do something like this, uh, you absorb much more. And at least I do. And I remember it and I, and I cherish it for a long time. Yes, yes, I, I can totally see that. Um, I had a, uh, a little time um, at Grand Teton National Park last weekend, um, and I just took a half hour to sit and paint at one of the rivers. And while I was mm -hmm. sitting there, um, this uh, amazing bird came uh, flying along and uh, dropped down into the water, came up with a fish, and flew away with it. <laughs> I oh, thought, wow, oh. you know. I couldn't have scripted that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Jane is asking, where did we stay? We stayed at the the big town there is Sarlat. And um, the, the, the villa or the chateau is just outside of Sarlat. And I cannot remember the exact name. It was within 10 minutes of that mid medieval city, which was a great place to paint as well. They have one of the most active uh, outdoor markets that I've ever seen. And uh, that's that's a great scene to paint, but I cannot remember the name, I'm sorry. Okay, does anybody have any other questions? And at this point, feel free to unmute and speak directly to um, Gary if you'd like. That uh, We've got a few more minutes and um, I'm Gary hasn't fallen asleep on us yet, even though it's like the wee hours of the morning. So you better, uh, you better, better ask him now. <laughs> There's been a lot of great stuff in the chat and uh, I appreciate all the compliments and the welcome that you've given me. Well, we certainly appreciate your painting for us tonight and walking us through the process and uh, being willing to stay up late and do that and be a part of our club meeting tonight. So thank you so much, Gary. You're welcome.
And uh, for those uh, those of you who are uh, fortunate enough to have signed up for his workshop uh, in October, mm -hmm. Danville, I know it's full and you guys are going to have a great time. So thank you very much. And I would just say good night. Okay. Thank you very much, Michelle. And I'll thank you to the membership for having me.